This is the Living and Loving Herb Podcast. This episode is brought to you by farmtobath.com, where a bath and body products are inspired by nature. Farm to Bath makes beautiful handcrafted goat's milk soaps, body and room sprays, sugar scrubs, salves, balms, and body oils using the herb, flowers, fruits, and vegetables grown in our farm. There are no preservatives, additives, dyes, or fillers. We use sustainable growing practices that are chemical and GMO free. So make sure you check out farmtobath.com. This episode is brought to you by Thompson Street Farm Learn and Play Series, Book One, Counting Starfish. This series is co-written with my daughter, Katie, who has severe cerebral palsy. Counting Starfish is an interactive book which teaches children the fundamental concepts of counting to 10 with coloring pages providing the opportunity for each child to create their own imaginative version of their own book. All the books in this series will have some kind of environmental theme. Counting Starfish was inspired by sea stars living in the tidal pools off the coast of Alaska. Counting Starfish is available on Amazon.com. Just search for the title, Counting Starfish, or go to the show notes and click on the link. There are two versions, a Kindle version, which is free, and a paperback version, which also includes the coloring pages. Hello, I'm Brenda Sullivan, and this is Living and Loving Herbs podcast, where I discuss different ways you can use herbs, whether it's using them for health purposes, culinary purposes, growing them in your garden, using them in bath and body products, or creating a chemical-free home. I'll share with you its traditions and history, because who doesn't love a good story? If I find a good book related to the subject, resources that might be helpful. I'll share them with a link under book recommendations and reference links found in the show notes. The goal of this show is to demystify herbs, their uses, and make it easier for you to incorporate them into your daily life. Today, I'm talking about building your immune system or boosting it and hopefully taking precautions not to get COVID-19. And these same uh, precautions that I'm going to talk about will also help with the common cold and flu. Just remember, I'm not a doctor. And if you have specific health questions, please consult a licensed medical professional. The information I share is for informational and educational purposes only and not meant to treat anyone. I do have some medical training or experience. I am a former EMT, which stands for Emergency Medical Technician. I hold a Connecticut State license as a nursing assistant and have worked in health care facility for several years and did home care for another home health agency. Uh, for the last 23 years, I've been home caring for my daughter who suffered a stroke before she was born and has a very long list of serious chronic medical conditions. Basically, my home is sort of a mini clinic, I guess, or hospital, and I have been trained to provide some skilled nursing care to my daughter if home nursing is not available. My daughter's care requires 24-7 nursing. Um, That's just to keep her stable. So we mainly focus on prevention, infections, and illnesses in general by boosting her immune system by, uh, by doing a variety of different things. So in this show, I'm going to mention some herbs that can help boost your immune system and or at least reduce some of the milder symptoms if you get a cold or flu virus. I also talk about a discussion or a debate going around in the interweb within the herbal community about elderberries and is it good or bad if you want to take elderberry syrup or a jam or whatever uh, when you have COVID-19. As all healthcare professionals have been pleading with the public, the number one goal for all of us is prevention. Don't get sick or expose others in the first place. And that has got to be our priority goal. As the grocery stores restock supplies and as growers begin a new growing season, I am hopeful that you can still pick up many of these ingredients that I talk about 
or they'll be available online uh, from herbal sources. And I know that a lot of people are out of stock, but I went through the list and I really tried to find common herbs that have really good properties in boosting immune. You know, I'll mention some easy recipes that you can make to have on hand just in case. And uh, in the coming week or so, I'm going to be publishing a free ebook for you to download or share with others uh, with a lot of this information that I'm talking about in the podcast. And it'll include the recipes, it'll include monographs of the different herbs that I mentioned. As we learn more on what types of herbs work better in treating COVID-19 symptoms, the ebook along with the primary references will be updated. This will be a work document and I hope to be updating it regularly as more information becomes available. Uh, So make sure uh, to check back to the website and updates as well. So I want to be clear, you know, there's no cure for COVID-19, none. There's, I know that there's talk about some vaccine or some medication and it's not true, okay? The CDC, the World Health Organization, are saying that there is no cure. There is no treatment. All the doctors and healthcare professionals out there, the only thing they can offer us if we get sick is to support us and treat the symptoms caused by the virus. So having said that, how are you? How are you doing? How did you survive your first week in quarantine? We are now... Um, this is what Tuesday of the second week um, of of the of the quarantine. My town has shut down. We are no longer allowed to go out except for essential items. The governor has declared non-essential businesses closed. You know, my family is doing well. We have no issues so far. Cross our fingers. Um, we all seem to be healthy. We do have some spring allergy sniffles. I may cough or sniffle during this podcast, but hopefully a lot of this will be edited out. My neighbors and I have all checked in with each other, and we all have a plan A, a B, and a C, uh, just in case somebody needs help. Um, there are volunteers standing by just in case somebody needs a, an errand to be run, um, which is comforting. You know, I've lived through something like this before. Uh, well, not a pandemic. I've never lived through a pandemic. Um, but being quarantined at home or community, not able to go anywhere. I grew up in California in the upper deserts. And we lived in a relatively, at that time, now it's not the case, but at the time we lived in a relatively rural area. And we had experienced some pretty crazy disasters. And I remember on several occasions, Roads and bridges were washed out from major floods and fires and earthquakes. Oh, my God. The only uh, grocery store near us was so badly damaged during a major 7.2 earthquake. Uh, It was closed for months. Now, one year we had the great floods come through. We had um, huge, what they call washes. And when those things uh, are overflowing, it just takes out roads and the bridges uh, were cut off. We were, we were basically marooned on a little island and um, nobody could get to us other than by helicopter. And I remember these gigantic military helicopters flying over our house with massive loads hanging from underneath and dropping it into the grocery store parking lot, which was, what, half a mile from our house. And, you know, it was flying really low. And as a child, it was scary. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. You know, schools were closed for months. Uh, because there wasn't any roads in or out. Uh, And then, you know, we had earthquakes also hit our area. And, you know, they were closed again, because uh, the buildings were not safe. And again, the the roads and bridges were knocked out or collapsed. You know, um, it was crazy. Uh, During the floods, I I still remember my mother holding a large canning pot under the end of a, a rain gutter, collecting the rainwater 
uh, off the roof because uh, there was no water. The floods had contaminated the sewer systems and we had no tap water. And so I remember my parents collecting rainwater uh, off the roof and they would boil it. And that's what we used to drink and cook with. Yeah, but my parents took it in stride. They were prepared for, for anything, which was amazing. And I was just talking to my brother about this the other day. You know, we, it's, we really were not afraid uh, because my parents were ready. They had shelves full of uh, fruits and vegetables that my mother had canned from the previous summer. We had peaches and pears and pickles. Um, They had a huge freezer full of meat and frozen milk. And, you know, basically we just camped inside our house. And the disasters I lived through were tangible. There was, you could see the damage you understood what the problem was. The bridge was out. Until that bridge was rebuilt, we knew we had to support ourselves. And you knew what needed to be fixed. But this, this virus, um, it's invisible. I can't smell it. I can't see it. I can't touch it. I don't know what direction it's coming from. And the only thing I can do is isolate myself and my family. I've been watching the daily numbers of our town and state for those who are testing positive and where they live and how close it's to me. And it's just crazy. And as of today, we have five new confirmed uh, COVID ID cases in our town. And one of them is just up the street. You know, for us living in Connecticut, in my experience of living here for 35 years, I've experienced blizzards and uh, with high accumulation snow rates, I've experienced damaging ice storms and hurricanes. But how do you prepare for a virus? How do you prepare for this invisible invader possibly could affect your life? permanently. You know, other than the the staples, you know, my husband thankfully now gets why I bought, always bought a little extra food. Uh, No, I'm not a hoarder. No, I'm not a what they call a prepper. Um, We don't have a lifetime of toilet paper or powdered milk, uh, but my husband's not complaining for the little extra food that I have now. Um, But we still need fresh eggs and foods, meat and dairy goods. Uh, But in the event that we get stuck, um, there are are local farms in the area that I can go and get those staples from. In addition, it's early spring and I got my seedlings started and growing. Uh, this year will be a focus on growing my own food. We have been able to at least plan for that. Other than finding medical support, finding immune boosting support, again, fruits and vegetables fresh. I know that there is a lull right now in the grocery stores, but I would start thinking about planning a garden right now. This is spring. Now's the time to start doing that. You can still get things going. And even if you live in an apartment, you can grow small things like microgreens. That's not hard to do. And it just so happens. It's totally by accident, I have to say. On March 10th, I published my latest book, which is uh, my garden journal, and it has many gardening ideas on how to create a garden, themed gardens, big or small. I also have instructions on how to build a worm farm to make your own nutrient-rich compost. So if you have any little kids that are love to do something like that, this is something that can be done right in an apartment. It doesn't matter. So in the event of this international crisis uh, that lasts longer than, you know, a couple of weeks, you know, what do we do? And my my conclusion is, having talked with several people, is that you have to create a plan. You have to have some backup. As the virus works through the community and our state and as our United States, this isn't going to happen overnight. This is going to be a prolonged process. I have decided that having gone through the physical uh, disasters, I think we also have to work on the emotional and health uh, plan. And that is prevention of getting sick in the first place and working on our immune system, building that that immune system. And so this is, what does this kind of plan look like? And here's some, some thoughts that I came up with. 
In the ebook titled Herbal Support for Cold and Flu Season by the Herbal Academy, they outline several categories for prevention and ways to minimize exposure to colds and flus in general. And they are good hygiene, healthy diet, and lifestyle considerations, which include also a healthy attitude. So good hygiene, other than stating what the obvious, what the healthcare professionals are drilling into us, you know, don't get the virus in the first place. Uh, We have to not uh, expose ourselves or expose others. We have to play our part, guys. I, you know, we have to play our part. And I am deeply disappointed that so many people that I know are not listening and not heeding the pleas of our local healthcare officials by staying home. This is not a game. You are not bulletproof and neither am I and neither is my family. Someone I know personally was, is not taking this seriously. And she basically smirked at me when I asked her if she was practicing social distancing. Frankly, she thinks that this is a joke. And I am I am deeply saddened that she doesn't think that this is something to be taken seriously. And she's putting my family at risk. And she's not, not only putting herself at risk, but her family and her other closest friends. You know, again, this is not a joke. And we are not bulletproof. You know, at the moment, there are no antiviral medications to treat this virus, despite the fact that a certain person in the White House thinks otherwise. You know, that annoys me, and I'm not, this is not a political show. The only thing we can do is listen to the doctors, and we have to let the virus run its course and treat the symptoms, which could be either mild or severe, which could be life-threatening, which requires hospitalization and oxygen and possibly a ventilator. If you are on a ventilator, it's not good. You are going to have a lifetime of complications if you get to the, if it gets to that point. And I'm not kidding here. I've lived in the hospital. I've I've seen some things and it's not pretty and it is scary. But to keep it lighter, if you want a little bit of entertainment and enjoy a good hand washing tutorial, that's the other way of preventing is to wash your hands. Check out Alton Brown's Food Network Celebrity Chef YouTube video called Abe's Hand Washing Demo, No Cleaver. I'll have a uh, link in the show notes for that. And it is pretty funny. And if you have kids and, you, you know, the kids, they don't uh, understand um, the severity of this. This would be a great video to show to the kids to teach them how to properly wash their hands. Okay, the other thing is the other big issue out there is, you know, the masks. Good luck finding a mask at this point. Um, But the CDC recommends that masks should be worn if you're sick yourself and or caring for someone who is sick or has autoimmune issues. And yes, I have a mask for my husband and I, but this is part of our prevention toolkit when caring for our daughter. I got these masks last year when my husband tested positive for influenza A. We had to make sure that we didn't give it to our daughter. And we always get our flu shots. I strongly recommend immunization. And so we use those masks. My husband wore gloves and he wore the mask if he was going to be around us. If we get COVID-19, you know, he's in a tent in the basement or out in the garage. He's not coming near us. So in wash down services, uh, frequently, try not to touch things like shopping carts and door handles and tables and computer keyboards and office phones and chairs and plane seats and seat belts. I mean, anything your hands are touching, don't touch. You know, we don't leave the house without a pair of gloves on. And, you know, a few weeks ago, when the government was just waking up to all this and alerting us about the seriousness of the virus, and I think that nursing home in Washington State had just imploded with this virus, I happened to be visiting my mother and requires two plane flights. And you bet when I walked through TSA screening wearing a pair of gloves so I didn't have to touch those containers because a million other people were touching those containers, I went through those screening machines with the gloves gloves on. Yeah, I got a weird look from the guys screening me. I even got pulled over and my bag got flagged to be searched. I had a Clorox wipes inside the bag and 
the guy pulls it out and he squishes it and he says, are these wipes? I said, you bet. And you better believe it. When I got to my seat, I took out those antibacterial wipes and I wiped down my seat, the armrest, the seatbelt, the tray table, the TV screen, the overhead air vent, all the reading materials in the back seat pouch. I wiped it all down. Then I offered wipes to any seatmates who wanted to do the same thing because it was the right thing to do. So I want to back up a little bit because the masks, I don't know if you can get them at this point or not. The World Health Organization and CDC does have some kind of recommendation on making homemade masks. There are going to be links in the show notes on a couple of ideas on materials, household materials that you might be able to use as filters. There was a group of researchers, let me back up, in I believe the Netherlands, who rated a bunch of different materials because when the N1H1 hit, which was, I think, the swine flu, they uh, they had a a run on masks. So they decided to, to do some testing on different various materials. Scarves rated the lowest in protecting any kind of virus from a normal surgical mask. Now, these are not N95 masks, which are the only thing that blocks the coronavirus. So check out the link. Their conclusion with the top rated household item was of all things vacuum cleaner bags. It blocked 86% compared to a surgical mask. Talking about a normal surgical mask. I'm not talking about an N95 mask. And the normal surgical masks only blocked 89% of a, a normal virus. You know, tea towels came in at 73. That was the next thing that came down. You know, so whether any of these items will protect you against COVID-19, I guess anything is better than nothing. And if you've got, you know, a scarf, oh, you know, I'd rather use a tea towel versus a scarf. So I'll have links in the show notes for that. If you're at a point where you think you need to make your own masks for family members, uh, it'll give you some ideas. Okay, the next item for prevention is the debate on the hand sanitizer. Uh, do you still need it if you're home? I don't know. I use soap and water. We don't, we're not using hand sanitizer. Uh, and I don't even know if you can get it in my neck of the woods. And, you know, to be honest, I've never been a fan of hand sanitizer to begin with because of the high alcohol content and it dries your skin. I much prefer warm water and soap. uh, And that is what the CDC suggests or recommends anyway is old fashioned hand washing is the preferred method and then followed by a hand sanitizer. But I get it. There are some times when soap and water is not available and all you have is hand sanitizer to do something to just protect yourself. So I have Uh, links in the show notes from the CDC on posters on how to wash your hands for various age groups. And, you know, and they're cute. They have little superheroes and princesses for children. And, you know, again, there'll be links in the show notes. If you buy your own hand sanitizer from somebody who has made it, uh, again, buyer beware. The recommendation between the alcohol content is 62% to 90%. So there's a lot of recipes out there that don't even come close to that kind of uh, percentage to make it effective. You, You know, it all boils down to proper chemistry. You know, the news has been filled with crazy stuff. I saw an article about a woman in New Jersey. She was arrested for selling hand sanitizer and her recipe resulted in several young children receiving second and third degree burns all over their legs and arms. And one boy was hospitalized. You know, and this also brings me to another point. Hand sanitizer is supposed to be for your hands. It is not to be bathed and you're not, you know, smeared all over your whole body. If you think you're that dirty, go take a shower or or a bath. Don't smear your family members in hand sanitizer. You're only going to cause burns. Another mother I saw an article I was a kid in plastic trash bags with flimsy surgical mouth thinking it, he was protective problem was that his nose was poking over the surgical mask and he wasn't wearing any gloves. So if you just wear a mask and you don't protect your hands with gloves, you're totally defeating the purpose. In my opinion, it's all or none. Either you wear the gloves and the mask or 
you take your chances. Having just a mask with no gloves, to me, no protection at all. And then uh, the other thing that I saw in the news, which has blown my mind, was, you know, spraying your kids down with household cleaners. Hello, toxic. You know, you're going to kill your kid by spraying them down with Lysol cleaners. Stop. Just throw your kid in the shower and give them a bath. Okay, so the other thing that was coming out in the herbal community that we had a lot of people concerned about, and again, this is buyer beware and the false advertising, and again, I'm not a certified aromatherapist, but the use of essential oils to cure COVID-19 is fraught, okay? I'm just going to put it out there. It is not, there's nothing that is going to cure COVID-19. There are no essential oils out there that are going to cure COVID-19. I'm seeing a lot of misinformation out there about how essential oils and their effectiveness. Uh, Just because it's natural doesn't mean it isn't safe. Essential oils should never be used directly on the skin and should always be diluted in a carrier oil such as almond oil, olive oil, or some neutral smelling oil. Essential oils should also never be ingested unless they are prescribed by a licensed healthcare professional who has specific training in ingesting oils as a treatment. There are countless cases reported of second and third degree burns and toxic shock, sometimes resulting in death of the person. Some oils, but not all, can be used in diffusers. Adding oils to water for inhalation treatments can be safe, but do your research on sites such as the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy for information on aromatherapists and classes on proper usage of essential oils. And finally, any company who claims that their essential oils cures anything, especially COVID-19, are committing fraud and will be cited by the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration, and the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. On Monday, March 9th, the FDA issued several warning letters to seven companies selling fraudulent COVID-19 products. Link to the press releases will be in the show notes if you want to read up on it. So please remember, there are no cures to this viral infection, and especially COVID-19. The only thing we can do is manage our symptoms, allow the virus to run its course, at the same time boost our body's immune system in a variety of different ways, which I will share with you in the second half of the show. The other item on the list is to eat a healthy diet during this whole quarantine time. Boosting your immune system should be the highest priority at the moment. There are many ways of doing this, but the easiest way is by eliminating junk foods such as sugar and processed food and eat a clean diet. In the next segment, I'll give you some recipes to help you change some things or boost your your diet. I know eating fast food or takeout frozen TV dinners is, is easier, especially when the grocery stores are empty. I stopped in my local uh, store yesterday and was surprised at how many shells that were normally holding staples, such as malt, cheese, and eggs, were completely empty. But understand, many doctors and healthcare professionals are urging all of us to take better care of our health and eat as clean as we possibly can. If we get sick and we're healthy, the chances of our recovering are far greater than us being weak. Uh, If you don't know how to cook, learn. There are tons of shows, food shows, YouTube shows, zillion online classes such as master class offering cooking classes. They teach you anything and everything from boiling water to complicated projects such as those fancy tiered cakes like the cake wars and stuff. Now use the downtime to learn how to cook. You'll be healthier in the long run. If you can boil water, you can make yourself a healthy meal. It's not that hard. The simplest meals to make are usually the most nutritious. And the other thing is to drink plenty of water and or warm fluids if you if it's cold out, such as an herbal tea during an illness. You know, staying hydrated helps our our body fight off infection and keeps all our systems running smoothly. And stay away from those sugary drinks. Sugar actually suppresses the immune system. The other thing that we can do to help boost our immune system is eat fermented foods. According to the Cleveland Clinic, eating fermented foods such as yogurt, sauerkraut, pickles, kombucha, 
kimchi or kefir are good for optimal health. Our guts have trillions of bacteria, good and bad. Fermented food helps good bacteria break down complex carbohydrates that you eat. According to the article, Five Reasons You Should Add More Fermented Foods to Your Diet, we swallow disease-causing bacteria every single day. Sometimes we get sick and sometimes we don't. Eating fermented food frequently helps our bodies fight the harmful bacteria from gaining a foothold. Research shows a less diverse microbiota is associated with chronic diseases such as obesity, asthma, chronic inflammatory conditions such as bowel disease. Fermented foods as well as probiotic supplements can also restore good gut health, especially after taking an antibiotic. Because you have to remember, when you take antibiotics, it kills everything, the good and the bad. And it's important to eat a well-rounded diet, which includes fermented foods and a probiotic supplement. The next thing on the list is eat as many fruits and vegetables daily. You know, remember what your mother said to eat your fruits and veggies? Well, she was right. Fresh frozen, or even dehydrated is better than the the commercially canned foods. You know, commercially canned foods uh, tend to have high amounts of salts and preservatives, and, and God knows what else they put in the can to help keep it stable. You know, but the products end up being less nutritional in the process. Um, If you can can your own food, that's at least a lot better than the commercial stuff uh, because it's less processed. And if you have your own dehydrator, buy a little extra fruits and vegetables and dry some for a longer shelf life. I love dehydrators and there are so many cool things that you can make with them. Now, fruit roll-ups are great if you want to make a nice immune boosting broth. You can use uh, dehydrate mushrooms and stuff. I mean, I do that with my mushrooms. I love shiitakes and turkey tails and, and they they're eat great to dry. These mushrooms have some excellent immune boosting properties and I've had some great success in managing treating some hormone issues by taking them in various forms. The unfortunate problem is that mushrooms have a short shelf life. So when I have a large flush of mushrooms in my garden, I can't, or I find them on sale at the grocery store, I toss them into my dehydrator and store them in a glass canning jar, so those huge mason jars, and that way they stay fresher longer, and it also keeps the bugs out of them. And when I need them, I just take what I need out of the jar, and then I pour boiling water over them, and then I let them soak in the, in the water for about 10 minutes, and it's like magic. They just pop back to life. It's great. And, you know, shiitakes are available in most grocery stores. Turkey tail mushrooms grow abundantly in the wild as well as reishi, but you really got to know what you're looking for. Um, I've yet to find wild reishis in the wild. I just buy them dried already from from an online uh, source. Still, if you've never gone mushroom hunting and you want to try it, I recommend that you team up with a local mushroom hunter and who will be able to teach you how to identify mushrooms because there are a lot of mushrooms that are poisonous. So you don't want to mis- misidentify. You know, spring is here and many farms are starting their spring season. Now would be a good time to see if any of the farms are offering shares in their CSA, uh, which stands for Community Supported Agriculture. You know, what that what you do, if you don't know what that is, is you pay a farmer up front, uh, which is called a share. And then in turn, they give you whatever they produce in that growing season. The other option is getting fresh veggies and herbs at your local farmer's market. I know in the state of Connecticut, the Department of Ag has decided to allow the markets to open. You know, in my area, the market will be open in late June. So let's hope this virus has subsided or has peaked in Connecticut by June, uh, because if it hasn't peaked yet, I don't think you're going to see me at the market. I just cannot afford to expose my daughter to any of these viruses and get sick. The next item on the list is lifestyle uh, considerations. If you don't have an exercise routine, now probably will be a good time to start one. It doesn't have to be complicated. Walking for 25 minutes a day gives you a ton of health benefits. And if you want to know more detailed information about some of my alternatives to exercising other than a gym, check out 
episode number four, Coping with Stress. I go into great detail on how I manage to get my walks in when I'm homebound and can't get outside. I have some pretty good um, things that work. It's a really good idea. So check that out. Some articles I've been, uh, I've seen recommended not to go crazy with exercise. The CDC in their article, Managing Stress and Anxiety, recommends you should continue to exercise regularly. And a link to that article will be in the show notes. Get some sun regularly. I know it's been, it was snowing all day yesterday, um, but the sun is out today. Vitamin D is necessary to building and maintaining healthy bones. Your body absorbs vitamin D by sun exposure. But if you're like me and live in the northern parts of the country, we don't get outside during the winter months because it's too cold or it's snowing. And as we age, we tend to be indoors more than out and our bodies don't absorb as much as we used to. Often doctors prescribe vitamin D supplements. Even uh, Dr. Anwar, who is a local pulmonologist here in our area who has been posting a lot of Facebook updates, who's been very good about that. And I really appreciate that. He is suggesting that we even take vitamin D. And again, and I'll have a, uh, if you're on Facebook, I'll have a link to his uh, update in the show notes if you want to check that out. I recommend if you don't know what your vitamin D levels are to get them checked and ask your doctor. Um, Then the only way you can do that is by having blood work done. So your doctor has to order it just in case you didn't know how to get your blood levels. And when your tests come back, that will be your baseline. So you know what that is and then you can go from there. And your doctor will usually tell you uh, what he wants you to do in treatment. For me personally, um, I had when I first started getting my tests monitored, I was really low and that was surprised me. And you know, I work outside uh, during the growing season. Normal levels were arranged from 20 to 40. My lowest reading was nine. And yes, I was experiencing a lot of crazy symptoms, including excess weight gain, exhaustion, and depression. You know, I just got my uh, levels tested last month, which was February, and I'm around 30. So I'm right in the middle, but I'm also have been prescribed 8,000 IUs. And the minute I stop taking my supplements, my levels tank. I got nothing in this reservoir. So beware, taking too much vitamin D uh, can have adverse side effects. So again, you got to work with your doctor. You got to know what your level is to begin with. And then you should, hopefully your doctor's testing you periodically so you can monitor how well you're doing and and getting a sun naturally and be taking your supplements. So get them checked. In the meantime, holistically, spend a few minutes outside in the sun. I'll have a link uh, to an article from Medical News Today titled Getting Vitamin D from the Sun in the show notes. The article suggests light-skinned people spend about 15 minutes per day outside and dark-skinned people spend about two hours a day. Uh, You can also invest in a full-spectrum light bulb and sit in front of that for a period of time. But again, before you do any of this, you need to know what your baseline is and whether you're deficient or not, because you don't want to overboard with the supplements. Whatever you're getting from the sun, if you're fine, that means you're spending enough time out in the sun and you're getting it naturally. And the other thing that I realized years ago was that, you know, sitting in a sunny window doesn't count as getting your vitamin D. I didn't realize that we need the ultraviolet B rays from the sun and they don't come through the windows. They're actually blocked. So sitting in front of a sunny window doesn't count. Other supplements you might consider is a multivitamin and vitamin C to help boost your immune system. But again, consult your doctor on your specific health questions. You know, and I'm only talking in general terms here. This is only information. That's it. I'm not diagnosing or treating anybody. The other thing is to get outside and breathe some fresh air. It's good for your lungs. It opens up the chest. You want to breathe deep, okay? We want that chest cavity, those deep breaths. Meditation, deep breathing and meditation is really good for the immune system. Fill those lungs with good, clean air. 
So part of a preparedness plan is to have supplies on hand. So in the event your family gets hit by an illness, there is no delay in starting supportive care. Understanding that there is no cure for this virus, the goal should be to minimize the symptoms of the illness at the same time boosting your immune system using readily available foods and herbs because food is medicine. I've been doing a lot of research in the last two weeks on on information from the herbal community on what herbs may or not work on this virus. And thankfully, some well-known herbalists such as Matthew Wood from the Institute of Herbalism published information on some conclusions from practitioners in China about what they learned treating COVID-19 patients. In addition, Stephen Bruner, author of Herbal Antivirals, Natural Remedies for Emerging and Resistant Viral Infections, has also weighed in on a controversy relating to elderberry and should it be taken if you become sick and diagnosed with COVID-19. Bottom line is do your research and make sure that you make the best decision you can. Nobody knows for certain which class of herbs will minimize the symptoms of COVID-19. We know they work in general for colds and flus, but COVID-19 is a different virus, and there hasn't been enough clinical work done at this time for the clinical herbalist to have uh, share their knowledge. So a lot of this is looking at the chemistry of the herbs and what the symptoms uh, are being reported reported with with COVID-19. So I think at the moment, we're just going to have to make the best educated decision uh, with what we have. Beware, some of these herbs may have safety precautions if they're used in concentrated forms, such as a tincture or tea or a syrup. So check for any safety issues, such as allergies or medication interaction and proper dosing before you start taking something. Again, just because it's natural doesn't mean that it isn't dangerous in concentrated forms. So regarding herbs. So the general consensus I'm hearing from clinical herbalists is if you are sick or have minor symptoms and you think you might have COVID-19, is that they're leaning towards herbs that are warming versus cooling. And, And what does this mean? The herbs that have energetics that produce certain actions within the bodies, and that's what they mean by warming or drying. Herbs can be dry, warming, moist, cooling, or a combination. For example, dry and warming. These energetics are also matched to a person's underlying constitution or body type. And there are a lot of body types, just to not confuse you. For example, if a person's underlying constitution is deficient, they may be pale, with cold hands and feet, feel tired or weak, and prone to certain conditions. An herbalist might suggest herbs that are warming and may carry a drying Uh, to get the circulation moving. And I know that this is an extreme oversimplification. It takes years to be able to properly diagnose somebody's constitution and and picking herbs that would be a good match. Uh, So I don't want to confuse you. But my point at this moment is well-respected clinical herbalists are suggesting working with more warming herbs than cooling herbs for COVID-19. Although using a combination of cooling and warming has also been thought to be acceptable, but you want to really focus on opening up the chest so you can breathe deep. Herbs that will thin the mucus so it can pass out of the body and not clog the airways. From what I'm reading and hearing from doctors on the front lines, this virus seems to uh, clog up the bronchioles in the lungs. So you want herbs that are considered warming, So what herbs are considered warming and what herbs are considered cooling? The first herb that I picked was fresh garlic, which has a variety of health benefits such as lowering cholesterol, stimulates the immune system, and thins mucus, and is a warming herb. Some of its herbal actions are anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, and immune stimulant. 
an idea. I mix garlic and local honey. I let it ferment for about three months. And if I have a cold or I'm incredibly stuffy, I'll take a teaspoonful of the garlic and honey a few times a day. But if you don't have three months to wait, if you're brave, you can try eating a fresh clove daily. (laughs) Good luck. You can uh, stand it. Or the other thing that you can do is add garlic to your food, like soups, sauces, or on top of pizza or roasted chicken, which is what I mostly do. I try and incorporate garlic into our meals as much as I can. You know, local honey is very important. It has a list of medicinal properties, and some of them are, you know, they help with cough, asthma, burns, cuts, wounds, eczema, dermatitis. Honey is also wonderful as a sweetener. It can be added to teas or other just tasteful herbs. You know, for a cold or dry cough, honey coats and soothes the raw sore throat. And I want to say avoid commercially mass produced honey. Usually those honeys are cut with high fructose corn syrup and that's why it's cheaper. So you're not really getting real honey. You're getting a a diluted version of it. Find a local uh, beekeeper or a farm stand that sells local honey. I really highly recommend that you support your local beekeepers. I understand farm stands or markets will be open soon uh, during the quarantine, so you should be able to find local honey. Ginger, fresh ginger, not dried, is a warming and drying at the same time. It has a long list of herbal acts such as anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, circulatory, and stimulant. Fresh ginger has volatile oils that stimulate the immune system to fight against bacterial and viral infections. I recommend you keep some fresh ginger on hand if you have any cold symptoms. You know, run the ginger through a juicer and drink ginger juice a few times a day. Thyme, fresh or dried, is okay to use. Thyme's energetics is a warming and drying. It's the perfect herb for breathing difficulties. Its volatile oils act as a bronchial dilator and has antimicrobial properties that fight certain bacteria involved in upper respiratory infections. You can either drink it as a warm tea or use it as a steam decongesting bath. But be careful if you already use a prescription inhaler, such as a steroid. Talk to your doctor first before doing any herbal decongesting steam treatments because herbs have adverse effects when mixed with prescription drugs. The next herb on the list is echinacea, and these can be either the roots and flowers and stems and leaves as well, and is usually dried, not fresh. Now, this is a herb that's cooling, and you probably uh, drink this in general as an immune booster and not something to treat symptoms for COVID-19. Echinacea is native to North America and is now cultivated throughout the world. It's mostly used as an immunoculant which encourages nonspecific immunity. It can have some effect on allergies and autoimmune conditions. So be careful if you've got an autoimmune system. The most common concentrated form is taken by a tincture. According to Stephen Bruner's book, Antiviral Natural Remedies for Emerging and Resistant Viral Infections, he recommends taking echinacea in a tincture form. In his book, he writes 1 to 5 ml three times a day and for acute situations, 30 drops every hour. You can find echinacea tinctures widely available in health food stores or online herb stores such as Mountain rose herbs. Links in the show notes. And no, I'm not getting any money for recommending anybody. So just know that off the top. I'm recommending them because that works. The next herb on the list is peppermint. Fresh or dried is fine and its energetics are cooling and drying. If you have an upset stomach, drinking peppermint tea is the best thing you can do. Peppermint is an anti-congestant, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, antioxidant, antiviral, and a nervi, which means it's a relaxing and calming herb. This herb also has several other herbal actions, but I'm only going to name the top ones at the moment. Peppermint 
or mints in general. So if you don't have peppermint, you got spearmint, that will work as well. Are perfect for calming upset stomachs, such as nausea and vomiting, gas, bloating, intestinal cramps, and diarrhea. It's the perfect herb for also giving to children as a tea. Uh, You can drink this cold or hot, and its energetics are cooling properties. The next herb on the list is elderberries and flowers. Just a side note here, for many herbalists, elderberries and flowers are the first thing they think of when treating a cold or flu symptoms. However, there is a huge discussion within the herbal community whether elderberries should be given if you have COVID-19. Many leading clinical herbalists such as Stephen Bruner, author of Herbal Antivirals, Natural Remedies for Emerging and Resistant Viral Infections, has been posted posting comments not recommending elderberries as an immune stimulant if you have COVID-19. And when I say posting, I'm talking about his Facebook page. Stephen stated in his last posting, March 11th, I do not suggest elderberry for this infection, but rather decocted elder leaf. I am unsure and everyone else is as well, whether that would cause a flare. Personally, I do not like elderberry for anything elder leaf is much better. And what he means by a flare is another herbalist posted an article stating that elderberry and flower may cause something called a chitotene storm, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and what is that? Okay, what what is that? So the this is described by Dr. Randy Crone, MD, PhD, in an article titled COVID-19, Do Not Forget the Host in Treating This Disease. A chitotene storm is the result of an immune system gone wild. The body's own killer immune cells are often defective, resulting in increased production of inflammatory proteins that can lead to organ failure and death. So basically, your immune system goes nuts and it starts attacking itself. You end up having major organ failure and yeah, some people have died. Has this been confirmed? No, there is no evidence at this moment on whether elderberries will cause the immune system to attack itself or not. So beware if you're an elderberry lover and you swear by elderberry to treat colds and flus. Both Stephen and Matthew are suggesting that you save your elderberries for your next common cold or flu and skip it for treating symptoms for COVID-19. So as aside from using elderberries for COVID-19, they are a wonderful herb in general. And the herbal actions are anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, antiviral, immune stimulant. The flowers are alternative, anti-inflammatory, antispasmatic, diaphoretic, diuretic, and of all things, it's a nervine, which means it relaxes the muscles. Its energetics are cooling and commonly used to address symptoms related to cold and flus. Again, uh, because we're running into the growing season, you don't want to use unripe elderberries because they're considered toxic and could cause severe illness such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Fresh berries also contain um, cyogenic glycosides and should not be eaten in large quantities. So what a lot of herbalists do is that they cook the uh, the berries. Um, they dry them. Well, I use them dried. I don't use fresh berries, although I do have some plants that I are sitting in my greenhouse right now waiting to be planted. I'm just waiting for the weather to warm up. Um, so they will be dried most likely, and then I will use them from there. I will cook them down and reduce the, the glycoside content. Okay, so the next item on the list is fermented foods, things like yogurt, sauerkraut, pickles, kombucha, kimchi, and kefir. Eat your kimchi or your yogurt every day. It is good for you. You need those microbiotics in there. Organic fresh fruits and vegetables, fruits like um, fresh lemons for teas and oranges, berries such as blueberries, strawberries, they all have antioxidant and natural vitamin C. So you want to have those on hand. Other vegetables that are nutritious and have immune boosting properties is called burdock root. And I know burdock is not something that you see in your local grocery store, but 
I find it at Whole Foods and it is a great, great herb. It, it's a root. Now it looks kind of scary, but it tastes great. I like to eat it. It can be either eat fresh or, or you can cook it. The other items are onions and garlics, cabbage and leafy dark greens, mushrooms, the shiitake and turkey tail. You should also have a variety of herbal teas on hand that will help you treat cold and flu symptoms. The other thing that you should have on hand is organic apple cider vinegar with the mother. You don't want the distilled apple cider vinegar. That's not going to give you the health benefits that you need. This is handy to have on hand so you can make a very simple drink called fire cider, which is fermented vegetables with extract of a boatload of immune boosting properties in general. Fire cider has warming energetics and it's always good to have this on hand. And if you want to learn more about fire cider, I recommend you check out episode number two of our podcast, Immune Boosting Tonic, the gift Rosemary Gladstar gave to the world. I go into incredible details detail on the history of it and the recipe. And there's uh, pictures on the show notes of my process of how I make fire cider. The other item that should be in your toolkit is rose hip. Rose hips are make a great tea and that is cooling and drying. They are high in vitamin C and helps boost your immune system. The easiest way to use rose hips is in a drink as a prevention. You can purchase rose hips in already packaged in tea bags. You know, either way, either you buy a bag of a bulk and you just take a teaspoon out and you put it in a cup and you boil your, your just below boil water, you make your tea, drink that. I used to, years ago, I used to have, every morning I used to have rose hip tea every single morning. And I think that was the first year I never got sick. And I worked at the bank at the time. Another group uh, that you should have on hand are the warming herbs known as chai, C-H-A-I. A paraphrase from Wikipedia is, what is chai? It's a mixed spice tea made by brewing black tea or green tea with a mixture of aromatic Indian spices and herbs. Chai originated in India. The beverage has gained wide uh, worldwide popularity, becoming a feature in many coffee and tea houses. Although traditionally prepared as a decoction of green carmadin pods, cinnamon sticks, ground cloves, ground ginger, and black peppercorns together with black tea leaves. This is a simple tea to make and it is very tasty on a cold day. So now we have the um, the last section of our podcast, and I'm going to talk about the recipes in the event that you get sick. So uh, a lot, again, a lot of these recipes will be online for free download on those show notes. I, and then I will also put all of this in a ebook so you can just download the whole thing and you just have a handy reference. Okay, so tea and juice ideas. Uh, helpful idea in making tea is in bulk. If I know I'm going to be drinking a lot of tea during the day, I'll make it in a large mason jar. And when it's cooled to room temperature, I just put a lid on it and I store it in the refrigerator. And then during the day, I'll just keep warming it up as I need it. And I put the rest in the refrigerator so it stays fresh. So honey, lemon, ginger tea. Now this is for a sore dry, scratchy throat. So you just have one slice of lemon and a few slices of ginger, fresh ginger, not powdered, uh, in a cup of hot water and honey to taste. Let it steep for five to 10 minutes and sip as many cups as you feel needed. Now, again, a word on ginger. Ginger's got to be fresh for the antiviral properties. You need those essential oils. A dried, once the ginger's dried, the properties change. Yes, they're still healthy, but for antiviral, you want that fresh ginger. The next tea I recommend is a mint and lemon tea, and this is perfect for upset stomachs, um, and it has antiviral and does boost your vitamin C levels. And this, you add a teaspoon of mint and a wedge of lemon to a cup of just off the boil water. Let it steep five to 10 minutes. My other favorite go-to tea is rose hip. Uh, rose hips has immune boosting properties and has a high level of vitamin C. Two teaspoons of dried rose hips in a cup of just off the boil water. Let it steep five to 10 minutes. 
Uh, here's a great recipe, and it's been adapted for Mountain Rose Herbs, is Robus Chai Tea. So the ingredients list is four cups of filtered water, one cup coconut milk or favorite nut milk, two teaspoons organic red Robus Chi, two tablespoons of organic ginger root, one teaspoon organic carmadin pods, so one organic cinnamon stick, half a teaspoon organic whole cloves, half a teaspoon organic whole black peppers and raw honey to taste. So you get a pot and you combine all the ingredients uh, except for the sweetener in a large saucepan and slowly bring to a boil. Reduce heat to medium low and simmer for additional 20 minutes, stirring occasionally. Strain through a fine sieve strainer and sweeten to taste and serve hot. Ginger juice uh, is another item on the list, uh, and this came from Stephen Bruner's book. It is an antiviral, and again, you recommend your ginger. Run it through a juicer if you got one. If not, grate it. I know ginger doesn't last long in the refrigerator, and you really want to save this when you first have symptoms of, a, of any kind of illness. So what I've done is that I, when it, ginger was on sale, I would buy a big bag of it, and then I would run it through my juicer, and then I would freeze it in uh, ice cube trays. And then I take the, the fiber, the debris from the juicer, and then I would fill another ice cube tray. I'd take like a pinch of it, and I'd put it in the, an empty ice cube tray, and then I'd fill that with water. And then I would just, I froze the rest of it in another container. And so I have ice cubes, one of juice and one of the frozen ginger fiber in water. And so when I get sick or I'm starting to have symptoms, I will take that ice cube out and I will drop that into a cup and I will add warm water to it and it will melt. And then I have my nice potent ginger juice. So here's another favorite of mine, an immune boosting tea. It's high in vitamin C and it has hibiscus in it. And I know hibiscus isn't something that you find in most grocery stores. Uh, so you may have to order this online. So the uh, ingredients for this recipe is half, one part, um, excuse me, one part hibiscus, one part rose hips, a half part lemongrass or ginger root, half part lemon peel, one quarter echinacea, and one part cinnamon chips. So you can take your cinnamon sticks and you can just crunch them up um, and make chips out of them. Mix herbs together in a large bowl and store in an airtight container. So you have a, this makes a big batch. So then you just take two teaspoons of the mixture into a cup of just off the boil water and let it steep for five to 10 minutes. And then you add honey to taste. The next item on the list are soups. I love soups. Uh, here is Dr. Weil's immunity broth. Um, this you can make ahead and freeze it. Uh, this recipe calls for an herb called astragalus. Uh, and I've never found this in the grocery store. So you may have to go buy this at a health food store uh, either near you or online. So that's just a heads up about that. But you can still make the broth. If you don't have astragalus, you can still make the broth. Now, um, he says here, the recipe calls for fresh. The adding it dried is just fine. Uh, who has fresh astragalus hanging around? So the ingredient list is one, one and a half teaspoons virgin extra olive oil, two large onions thinly sliced, three garlic cloves mashed, one tablespoon minced fresh ginger, four ounces of shiitake mushrooms stemmed and thinly sliced, two large carrots thinly sliced on the bias, two and a half pieces of stragglers root, 10 cups of mushroom stock, and again, I'll have a link to the stock in the show notes, Two tablespoons of tamari or, or low sodium soy sauce, salt, two cups broccoli florets, and a half a cup chopped scallions. So the instructions are, in a large pot, heat the olive oil over medium heat. Add the onions, garlic, and ginger and saute until soft and translucent. Add shiitake, carrots, astragalus root, and mushroom stock. Bring to a low boil. 
reduce the heat and simmer for 45 minutes. Add the tamari and adjust the seasoning with salt if needed. Add the broccoli florets and cook until tender, about two minutes. Remove the astragalus root pieces, ladle the soup into bowls, and garnish with scallions before serving. And this recipe is a true food kitchen recipe off of his website, and I'll have a link to that. The other thing that you can do is just make old-fashioned chicken soup. Nothing's wrong with that. We all love homemade chicken soup. And as a last resort, if you're that sick um, and you just can't bring yourself to cook anything, order wonton soup from your local Chinese restaurant, believe it or not. I've discovered that the broth in wonton is high in salt, that it will help you uh, with your symptoms of cold and flu. And it is soothing and it'll give you the extra um, protein that you need. Under the fermented foods category, I have a super recipe that I love called the apple cranberry sauerkraut. And even if you have kids, I think they'll like it too. We eat it a lot here. If you want to make this, you have to have some equipment here, I'm afraid, unless you're pretty creative. Again, you can go on YouTube. You can search the internet. You can find other ways of making your fermented um, foods. Uh, but there is an easier way. And yes, it's going to cost a little investment in some equipment. But you'll have it forever. Okay, so I, rem- I recommend that you get a product called Easy Fermenter. It's a wide mouth kit. It's simplified uh, fermenting in jars, mason jars, uh, and not crock pots. You can make sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, or other fermented probiotic foods. This kit comes with three lids and an extractor pump and a little booklet of recipes. I like it. It was the best thing that I ever invested in. You don't get the jars, though, so you're going to have to get jars. And so they have regular uh, lids for regular canning jars and wide mouth lids for wide mouth canning jars. And I recommend that you get the wide mouth because you need to get your hand inside the jar if you're going to be squishing down your vegetables. And that costs on Amazon Right now, it costs $26.98 for the kit. And that's, again, that's not including the jars. So uh, then I went to my local grocery store and I got a half gallon mason jar. And I think you do, you get like six of them in a box. You can't just buy one. So you're going to have to buy the box. Um, and if you can't get half gallon canning jars, you can buy them online on Amazon or uh, if you don't have the room, you can use regular quart jars Uh, But you're going to have to use more than one because these recipes usually call for like a half gallon jar. The other product I recommend that you get is a box of cutting edge cultures uh, to start the fermenting process. Or you can use kefir whey if you have some uh, instead if you don't want to use starter. And I think the little booklet inside the box has ways, if you don't have a culture starter, what you can do to get things moving. Um, It's optional. You don't have to use the culture starter, but I found that it just helps things move a little faster. You get a box of six pouches, which will run you about $22.95 on Amazon. And I know it's pricey, but being healthy is cheaper in the long run. So just remember that these are investments in your health here. Another product that I use is a glass weight. It's It's for fermenting and it fits inside your canning jars. They come in a four pack. They work great, and I, when I'm done with my fermented process, I just toss them into the dishwasher, and I sterilize them, and I put them back in the box, and they're ready to go for the next batch. And a box of four costs $16.99. So in addition, before I get into the recipe, this recipe is adapted from uh, a website called Cultured Food Life. So just for transparency reasons, I, I took their original recipe, and I, I adjusted it to suit my needs. Oh, and before I start, no, I'm not getting any royalties from recommending products. I'm only recommending the products because I know that they work and I use them myself. So that's why I'm mentioning them. Okay, so the apple cranberry sauerkraut. You need one package of cutting edge cultures or a half a cup of kefir whey. Uh, Less culture, uh, the powdered culture, if you're making less sauerkraut. One cup filtered water. 
a uh, half of a small cabbage shredded into very small pieces, one medium sweet apple such as Honeycrisp, and a quarter cup dried cranberries, one medium orange juiced, and you want to keep all that pulp, so you really want to get in there and get all the juice and pulp out of that orange. And then you need enough filtered water to cover the vegetables when you're done when you're putting them in the jar. Step one. If you're using the culture starter, you know, you need to dissolve a packet into one cup of the water. If you're using kefir, just set aside your cup till the end. Step two, you want to shred all your vegetables except for the cranberries and put them in a large bowl. Then you add your salt and you mix well. Add the juice of the orange and pulp and again, you mix well. Now you take your stuff in the bowl and you fill your half gallon mason jar. You may need a tamper to squish the vegetables down. And if you have too much in your jar, then you may have to start a second jar. So sometimes that happens and that's okay. Just go ahead and start your second jar. You know, step six, you add your dissolved culture or kefir whey. And if you have more then one jar divide up the culture amongst your jars. You, you may have to add a little extra packet. You may have to use two if you have like four jars. There's not going to be enough. Fill your jars up with filtered water and cover the vegetables. Slide a knife along the sides and down the center of the jars of your vegetables to get all the bubbles out. Then you want to drop your weight, your glass weight on top of your vegetables and fill the rest of the jar up to about a half an inch from the top with the filtered water. You need enough room for the gas to escape. You don't want to fill the jar all the way up. You need about a half an inch at the top of the jar. Then you place your lid, your airlock lid on the jar, and then you follow the instructions from the Easy Fermenter Kit on maintaining your jars during the fermenting process. So they are going to have to be babysat. You can't just leave them alone and walk away. You're going to have to look at them every day and see what's going on. Now, I like to ferment this particular recipe for about 10 days because I like that light tangy flavor. Again, you're going to have to test it and see how things are going. Some people really like that zinger sour taste. And so they let that ferment even longer. The next recipe is the Herbal Academy's Quick and Simple Elderberry Syrup. Now, I know this is not supposed to be used for COVID-19, but we also have regular colds and flus, and this is a great medicinal option for you. So that's why I'm including it. So the ingredients are one cup dried elderberries, six cups water, a quarter ounce ginger, a handful of cloves, and one and a half cups of raw honey. And if you notice, they've added two warming herbs, which are ginger and cloves. So they're combining two warms with one cooling herb. So the directions are bring berries and water to a boil and then simmer for 30 minutes. Strain the berries and return liquid to the heat. Add one quarter ounce grated ginger and a handful of cloves. Simmer gently for another 45 to 60 minutes or until two to three cups of liquid remains. Remove liquid from the heat, allow to cool to room temperature. Stir in one and a half cups of raw honey, and then you can bottle and label and refrigerate. This cannot be left in a cupboard. It has to be refrigerated. This is not shelf stable. So if, if you have a scratchy dry throat or a cough, take two teaspoons every three hours at the first sign of a virus or cold or flu symptoms. The next item in your toolkit should be a decongesting herbal steam. The Herbal Academy also has another recipe called Decongesting Herbal Steam. So I may do some jars that I can sell online through the Farm to Bath website, so stay tuned. I do have some stuff in stock that I may be able to make enough to sell online if you don't want to bother making your own. So you can also use other herbs if you don't have the one that they are actually recommending. So the other herbs that you can put together is thyme, uh, the combinations as well, thyme, thyme and rosemary, mint, mint and lavender. So what you want to do is bring four to six cups of water to a boil and then to a large bowl. You pour these four to six cups in a bowl, add one tablespoon of of the herbs, and it can be thyme, 
It could be thyme and rosemary. It could be mint. It could be mint and lavender. It could be any of the combination. And then you want to let these herbs steep for five to 10 minutes. And then you, you bend over and you cover your head with a towel and you position your face over the bowl using the towel as a tent to hold the steam in. And you want to close your eyes and your face should be at five to 10 inches away from the hot water. And you just gently breathe in the herbal essence. So for no more more than 10 minutes or as far as you can stand it. And that should help open up the capillaries and in, in your lungs. And you may have to do this frequently as well. But if you're having an inhalator, again, you should check with your doctor first before you do this if you're taking any kinds of medication. So that's it. Um, at the moment, you know, there are several states that are now shelter in place. We are now one of them as of this morning. We don't know how long this will be. We're talking maybe schools will be out at least until end of April, maybe May. I don't know. I'd be surprised if the schools open back up again right now. I just, I just don't think that they're going to uh, do that. And we're all in this together, Okay. You're not alone. We're all in this together and we're here to support one another. And as I find out more information uh, from the herbal community, I have been attending online classes and I've been daily checking uh, their latest postings to make sure I get uh, the most accurate update information from the clinical herbalists that have a shop. And again, do your, your research. Okay. So this will pass. This too will pass. We will all get through this. There are scientists out there working very hard on treatments that will be effective. It's not going to be today. It's not going to be tomorrow. Uh, and maybe in, uh, at the end of the year, possibly, I don't know, depending on other countries and their uh, how fast they're working on getting effective treatments. I know China and some of their doctors and practitioners are trying to share the information that they've learned. I just heard that the, the city Wuhan has been opened up. They have lifted their curfew as of this morning. So that is good news. They're trying to get things uh, back to normal and uh, we'll get through this. It's okay. We'll get through this. I'm in the process, again, of putting together a free ebook with these helpful tips and recipes and the newest information that I can get. I will be updating the information as I get it. Uh, so keep checking back for updates as new information is learned. So be safe out there. The next episode, uh, we're going to try and start talking about gardening and getting your gardens going. Now is the perfect time. If you want to get your kids involved, I just published my latest book, My Garden Journal, a how-to garden book for kids uh, ages 9 to 12. Um, this is also great for parents. I have some really cool themes like uh, growing a popsicle garden, a section on books and themes such as a secret garden or the Harry Potter garden, instructions on how to build a worm farm and make your own compost, plus a whole season's worth of journal pages tracking how your garden is doing and, you know, what things to remember for next year. Uh, so check it out. It's available on Amazon internationally, as well as in the United States, as well as Barnes & Noble. Hopefully, it'll be available in libraries. And if your library does not have this book for checkout, please call them and ask them to get it because it should be available in all the libraries, at least in the United States. Internationally, it should be available in bookstores as well. I've published this, what they call wide, through a distributor, Ingram Spark. So they should be able to have this book available internationally as well. So thank you for listening. Be safe and God bless. Hi, everyone. It's Brenda again. Just a few more things before you take off. On Fridays, I'll post a quick newsletter called Five Herb Friday, sharing five things related to the world of herbs. It could be a cool recipe, a cool idea for using herbs around your home, a DIY bath and body product, a gadget, a book, or an article or website I found helpful and think you might enjoy it too. It will be short, to the point, and full of good positive energy that will send you off for an awesome weekend. So go to livingandlovingherbs.com and sign up for this short email. This episode was brought to you by farmtobath.com, where our bath and body products are inspired by nature. 
Farm to Bath makes beautiful handcrafted goat smoke soaps, body room sprays, sugar scrubs, salves, balms, and body oils using the herbs, flowers, fruits, and vegetables grown in our garden. There are no preservatives, additives, dyes, or fillers. We use sustainable growing practices that are chemical free and GMO free. This is just for our listeners of Living and Loving Herbs podcast. We're offering a buy one, get one free on our goat's milk herbal soaps. This offer is only for our podcast listeners. Just type in the promotion code LLH podcast at checkout. The code again is LLH podcast. Go to farmtobath.com and check check out our products and don't forget to order your soap. Until next time, have a happy and blessed day and thank you for listening.